Boston. I'm the uh, marketing manager at an organization called Business Link. How many have you have heard of us? And the ones I've all met with. <laughs> so Business Link is a nonprofit organization that helps people start businesses. We're, we're based out of Edmonton, but our mandate is all of Alberta, which is why we're here today. Uh, we do events all across Alberta and talk to people about how to successfully start a business. Um, today, my passion is talking about branding and everything marketing. I'm a huge advocate for small business, which is why I work for a nonprofit that starts small businesses. I managed a small business with my brother for about five years in the healthcare industry. And I have an extensive background uh, about 10 or 15 years working in marketing, communications, PR, all that kind of stuff. So I went to school for all those, those things they teach you that you should be doing in business. And then I jumped into business with my brother and forgot about all that stuff. I just wanted to make sure that the payroll and the bank account was good. You guys know what I'm talking about? So I really had to learn how to kind of adapt to be you know, really practical with marketing. So I'm talking about branding today. Um, this is a topic that a lot of marketers talk about. And my sort of perception on it and my take on it is a little bit different when it comes to small business. And so I'll talk to you a little bit about the difference between these big corporate brands and these big corporate brand entities and, and what we think of as a brand and what your personal brand is and what that means to you in small business and how you can actually be effective in your branding and in your marketing even though you're just this little guy running your business. I give you guys all a handout too, which I will talk about a little later on that will actually give you an activity to, to do some homework. And if you don't do it today, that's fine, but I encourage you to try to take it away and do it uh, when you get home. So first off, I kind of want to get a sense of what's your thoughts on the word branding? When you think of branding, what comes to mind? Name recognition. What's that? Name recognition. Name recognition, yeah. Anybody else? A graphic or a font, okay. We often think of that visual representation of a brand, right? Anyone else? A slogan? Perception. Perception, that's a good one. Reputation. Reputation, yeah. Musical tune. A visual. Musical tune. A musical tool. Tune. Tune, oh yeah. Okay, like an audio brand, yeah. Okay, so some people would say, to simply put, a brand is what your prospect thinks of when he or she hears your brand name. So it's that perception that comes into play. So that, you know, what do I think of and what do I associate with when I think of that brand? And we often associate the big brands like the Coca-Colas and the Googles and the Apples, those big brands, and what comes to mind when we think of those. So that's, that's what we're, we're talking about right now. So when do you, what do you associate with these big brand images? It can be good, bad, or ugly. I have no affiliation to them <laughs> at all. When it comes corporate, to mind. Corporate giants. Corporate giants. Anything what? else? Identity. First identity. thing is identity. Yeah. Success. Sorry? Trust. Trust. Okay. Or lack thereof. Or lack thereof. <laughs> Do you think about any kind of experiences when you think about these brands? Like how you engage with some of these types of companies. That's a big thing for Apple, right? That whole experience and being innovative, all that kind of stuff, kind of stuff right? So I think that you guys touched on a lot of key elements about these brands, and that's why I put the big corporate brands up there, because I think a lot of times as small business owners, we just think it's not even possible to have a brand. How am I gonna have a brand image like Coca-Cola or Apple or Google when I have no marketing dollars or very little marketing dollars and I have no idea what I'm doing and I don't even have a, an idea of how to get my brand out there. So this is what I'm gonna kind of try to hopefully put, uh, rest your mind that you can actually have an impact without having to have a big brand like this. So this is a great quote I found in Forbes magazine. Your personal brand should represent the value you are able to consistently deliver to, to those whom you are serving. It's a little wordy, so I would encourage you to not be that wordy. <laughs> but you know what that says is a couple things that stand out in this statement to me when I think about brands. It represents a value, so it's more than just this big corporate image. We're all sitting in this room here, we all have personal values, right? 
and we all have company values for our own business. Whether you think you do or not, you do. And the other part that's important to this is consistently de deliver. So when you think about a brand, this is a promise. And that is the easiest way to define a brand is this is a promise. So when you're saying to your customers, I do this for you, ask yourself if you're really doing it. Are you really delivering on that promise? And are you consistently delivering on that promise to the people that you're serving? And that's the other key word, who you're serving. So we're always keeping in mind that you are delivering this promise to the people that you're serving. It's not about what you think you're doing, it's about how your customers are perceiving what you're doing. And that's what that exercise will help you out with. Does that make sense? Yeah? So uh, represent the value and consistently deliver. Those are two key statements that I, I like to pick out of this when I think of brands. Okay, so what's the difference between a personal brand and a product brand? Everybody knows product branding. Everybody, we just talked about those big logos and what we think of when we think of those companies. I often use, and I, for some of you who met with me in the Venture Lounge, like when you go to McDonald's in the United States, do you get the same kind of tasting Big Mac as you do here? Yeah, is there consistency in that? Yeah, whether you like it or not, it doesn't matter. It's consistent. You know, every single time you go to a, you know, a McDonald's all across the world, you're going to get a very consistent experience. That is part of their brand. So how am I going to do that on a personal level? So a personal brand, when you're first starting your business, you often are your brand. And I know some of you, you're running your own consultant companies, you're just starting up small as like a sole proprietor, you are your business. You are your brand. So everything that you do and that you say is a representative of your business. Good, bad, or ugly, right? Um, so a personal brand is what people associate you with when they think of you. So if I was to ask each of you, uh, not a best friend or not a family member, what customers think of you when they, when, they, um, when, they, when you come to mind, if I was to say, hey, what does Joe think of you in your business? Would it be a positive portrayal? Would it be a negative portrayal? Because they have a business relationship with you. When you're out having beers, you know, on a campfire, that's a whole other experience, right? But what their experience is with you when you're having a business relationship. It represents what you value and what you're able to deliver. So remember I talked about the value and the deliver consistently? It's the same thing. So what is it that you were saying, I value this in my business? This is where philanthropy can also play a role in your brand. And you'll see that in a lot of small businesses and big businesses that philanthropy and charitable work is part of their business because that's part of their brand. It's important to them as a company. They're not this faceless entity with a logo. They actually have core values that run through their business. And that's important to show that. Sometimes a brand is an asset that you must protect. So yes, it could be that big trademark logo, but it could also be your own personal brand. So I'm gonna use myself for an example because hey, um, put myself uh, for, up for, uh, for criticism. <laughs> so if I say that my personal brand is that I'm a small business advocate, what am I doing in my life every day in my actions that actually shows that? You know, am I, am I actually living my life in values and activities that actually are promising that? Well, I think I do. I work for an organization that's a nonprofit organization that supports small business. I volunteer on boards that represent small business owners. I go out and speak and share what I love to people who are small business owners. And I actually shop local too. I don't shop 100% local, but I try to as much as I can. And when I have friends who start small businesses, I give them advice, I share all their stuff online, I help promote them. Uh, if they have crowdfunding campaigns, I boost them, all that kind of stuff. So for me, that is my personal brand. Uh, and if anyone Googles me, you're gonna see that kind of stuff online about me. Okay, so to me, that still is an asset I want to protect because that's my reputation. So think of it that way too. It doesn't have to be this big trademark logo. This is about your reputation that you want to protect. So be very conscientious and thoughtful on everything that you do when you represent yourself because you are your business. And this is the other side that I think sometimes people forget, but your brand is influenced by who you associate with. So if you want to be around people who are influencers and thought leaders, um, 
in a particular area because you also want to be that way and you want to be close to that network, then it makes sense for you to associate with those people. If, for instance, um, I'm trying to think of an example of uh, one that wouldn't work in your favor. So, you know, people always say that, you know, you're, you're very similar to the kind of people that you're around. So if you're around people who aren't going very far in their life and they're always negative and they're kind of never moving forward in their lives and you're this real go-getter and you're trying to start your business and you're really actively promoting yourself and you're getting out there, then how is hanging around with the people who are negative and who aren't doing anything to support you and always bring you down and they're negative about everything, like how is that helping you? That actually does affect your brand too because people associate your reputation with who you associate with, right? Does that make sense? Right? There's an expression, I'm trying to remember, this is where I sometimes speak my notes, about um, the saying of uh, keeping your, your, uh, your enemies close and things like that, right? Just about who you associate with. So defining and living your brand. And I talked to some of you guys about this too. You came to the Mentor Lounge and said, I need help with marketing. And I said, well, do you know what your brand is? What is it that you're doing? What is it that you're promising to someone? Have you actually defined what that is about your business or yourself? Um, I think sometimes the best businesses, the ones when your personal brand and your professional brand are very closely aligned. And this is where I see a lot of small businesses doing really, really well. So let's say some sort of philanthropy is something that you are really, really, really passionate about. I don't know, maybe it's animal rescue or something like that. And you build a business that aligns with that brand, you're probably gonna be quite successful in how you go about doing it. Because your personal brand and your, uh, your personal values and your professional values are very tightly aligned. And so when people meet you and they do business with you, they're gonna see that all the way through in everything you do. So are you consistently living your brand, right? That's all the same thing. Are you actually living those values that you say you do? Um, or are you not? There's, there's a lot of examples in the political world where they don't do this. We're not gonna talk about those. But I mean, that's a really simple simple example, right? And where a lot of people get, get caught is, well, you said this in a public platform, but you're actually doing the exact opposite. That will absolutely kill you and your business if you go in and do something like that. This is kind of an interesting little survey. Uh, based on a survey uh, conducted, less than 15% of people have truly defined their personal brand. So understanding what that actual brand is. And less than 5% are living it consistently at work each and every day. Ooh, what does that say to you? A lot of people are lost. What's that? A lot of people are lost. A lot of people are lost. I think it's unfocused, right? I think it's unfocused and maybe distracted um, and, and not living consciously, right? Not thinking about all of your actions and what they actually are saying about you. And so I think that that's a good example to show you that if you choose to do the opposite of that, you're setting yourself way apart from everyone else, right? Here's another kind of explanation of a personal brand. It's the total experience of someone having a relationship with who you are and what you represent. And that one's, again, it's a little bit long, but I liked it because it's about this experience, right? So your brand is more than just this image. It's more than just this tagline, catchphrase. It's about a total experience and a relationship. So when you start to think about yourself and your company in that way, it totally changes things. And this is where the homework is. <laughs> so I'd like you, and you don't necessarily have to do it right now, but I'd like you to at least get started. I want you to think, when you're thinking about the context of that statement, write down the top five things that you would expect their experience to be. So this is someone external. Let's say this is a customer. In an ideal word, if you're a small business owner, this is a customer. If you were to ask, uh, or you were wanting to think what those people's experiences are of having a relationship with you in a business professional relationship, what are the top five things that you want that experience to be? That should be like your ideal state. I want them to have this kind of experience with me. You know, I want it to be that they're I'm outgoing and helpful or whatever those, those key things are. 
Does anyone want to share one or two? Professional. Professional? Okay. Trustworthy. Trustworthy, honest. Okay. Satisfaction. Okay. Safe. Safe. Okay. Reliable. Reliable. Awesome. Those are all good words. And they don't have to just be one word, right? But I think that those are those are a good start. So what you just identified are your brand values. Okay, one of our business link brand values is engaging. So when we do presentations and when we interact with people, we're really engaging. So I'm asking you guys to answer questions and I'm getting you to do a little bit of homework instead of just lecturing. Because that's one of our core values at the organization. Another one is being helpful, which is what we do every day. Does that make sense to everybody? It's a bit of a tricky exercise, but it really makes you think very differently than what you currently think. So then the, the next thing that you do about, do about this is great to think about what you ideally want other people to think of you and that experience, Have yeah, go and ask them. <laughs> and don't ask your friends and family. It does say a close friend, I have to edit that. <laughs> ask a customer to do this exercise. Okay, so you've been a customer of mine for, I don't know, six months or whatever, or maybe they're their, your first customer. Why don't you tell me what you think the experience is of working with me? And maybe they don't want to tell you to your face, maybe make it anonymous, but that's when you really know, is my brand, what I think it is, and my core values, is it really what people are experiencing? Because if it's not, you got, you got some work to do. <laughs> and that's okay. It's better to ask people about what that experience is that they're having with you and what their perception is of you and your business early on. And you should be doing it frequently, by the way, because as your business grows and changes, you want to be connecting and touching base and asking. Your brand might change. You might see a whole different arm of your business that you hadn't even thought about. Um, so make sure you're asking people this. So I encourage you to take home this exercise and get some people to also do this for you. Compare the two and see if there's anything that's not, um, that's it, there's any discrepancies, right? Does that make sense to everybody? Are you willing to do the homework? <laughs> I'm seeing nods. <laughs> see, there's always that question, yeah, I can do it, but will you do it? Will you do it? I think Cliff knows that one. Will you do it? <laughs> And what are some of the things that you think you can do to shrink that gap? So if there are discrepancies, does anyone actually even, you know, when you already are thinking about this, does anyone see any gaps right off the bat that they can, oh yeah, I don't know if a customer would say that about me. Can you be that humble? Or are you feeling really confident? Remember go back to the 15% and 5%? <laughs> okay, I won't ask, I won't pay them anyway. All right. So now we're gonna get into some practical strategies. So now that I've maybe defined what these core values are in my brand and some core statements of what I think this is, um, now what? So the next thing that you might wanna consider doing is develop your brand promise and your pitch. So what does your organization do? What do you do for people? What is the problem that you are solving? If you are not solving a problem for people, you don't have a business. Sorry. Um, and think about what that pitch is. If you can't quickly and easily explain what your business does to solve my problem as a customer, then I'm gonna have a very hard time buying anything from you because I don't know what you do. And people are very, very impatient nowadays. So uh, the quicker that you can convey that message and it conveys what your core value and core brand is, the better you're, you're gonna be. Become a thought leader in your area of expertise. I'm talking today about something I love and that I'm passionate about, marketing, branding, and so I'm sharing it. I'm not holding it close to me as intellectual property because a lot of these ideas aren't new. These are well-researched well ideas, but if I want to be known as a thought leader and someone in branding or marketing, I better get out there and talk about it and share it with people, right? So think about the areas of expertise you have. In this room alone, there's so much expertise, so share it. Start writing articles start going and doing presentations, do some pro bono work, sit down and do some one-on-ones. Don't give it all away for free, obviously. But the way you're gonna build some credibility is to become a thought leader in that area and someone who looks like they actually know what they're talking about, right? 
beyond just a really fancy tagline, a fancy logo. Again, share your expertise. The more you share, we are in a world of sharing, whether it be online or in person. Share, 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 everyone wants to share. Um, it is gonna help you though. It will actually help you extend, extend your reach and your exposure. And again, I'm talking about the who you associate with. So I talked to some of you in the mentoring lounge about associating with like-minded people and influencers. So if you don't know who the influencers are in your industry or people that you think could potentially be one step closer to your client, you better get to know them. Think about who those influencers are and associate with them. So then you, if you don't have much of a brand or much credibility when you first start, tack on to someone else's, right? Somebody else who's in that industry who maybe has a really strong reputation, partner with them. Of course, you have to bring something to the table. You can't be just the one taking advantage of their, their brand and their credibility. You have to bring something to the table, but you know, partner and look for those influencers. You're gonna be able to build your credibility a lot faster and build your brand a lot faster when you're working with someone else who already has it. And first and foremost, this should actually be number one. I'm gonna to to change this around. Deliver on your promise. The worst thing that you can do for you and your brand is to not deliver on your promise. That doesn't mean to say that you're not gonna have customers who are unhappy and that maybe you've made mistakes, but then acknowledge that. Don't try to hide it. You know, people are always worried about negative reviews online and negative this because it's so, it's so, uh, so much more amplified and obvious in the public domain. Just apologize. People just want to be acknowledged if you've made a mistake. But if you're going to say, I promise to do this, and this is what I do in my business, make sure you actually do it. And if you're not 100% confident in doing it, you might want to change what that promise is then. Does that make sense to everybody? What's the most frustrating thing when you go into a business as a customer to have happen? Horrible customer service. And doesn't everyone say we have exceptional customer service? It's like everyone's core value, right? And they're not delivering on it. That's so incredibly frustrating, right? All right, here's a fun little tool. And I should probably update this because it's a little bit old. There's this great tool called Clout online. And there's probably a thousand of them, but this one is just simple and easy. Um, clout means influence, right? So there's this great online tool that if you are online already, and you do have to have a bit of an online presence, um, that basically measures what your cloud or influence is based on scanning all of your online platforms, and it gives you a little number, um, and it finds your keywords, very googly in terms of keywords. What is it that you're actually talking about? I like to do this little exercise on myself to actually see if I am you know, living my brand, if I'm talking about the things that are important to me. And sometimes I get some surprises. <laughs> I'm like, what crowdfunding? What is that? I'm not a crowdfunding expert. Oh, because there's a whole bunch of events that for work we sponsored that were related to crowdfunding. So I was probably tweeting about it a whole heck of a lot for a while, right? If I was to do that again now, that probably wouldn't come up. So this is a great little online tool, one of many, to actually see if you are living your brand and talking about your brand and talking about the things that you are an expert in. So I talk a lot apparently about communications and newsletters is another weird one for me. Small business is there. There we go. Thank goodness, because I say I'm a small business advocate. I hope that comes up. Public speaking, uh, Edmonton, Calgary, Alberta. Well, that's where I live, so that makes sense to me. Um, and leadership. I to talk about leadership as well in my offline. So it's a fun tool to kind of rate yourself and you can kind of have fun with the score. Ooh, did it go up four points this month or did it go down? And it's just kind of a fun tool. It's completely free. So I encourage you to, to check it out if you want to get a, a sense, especially if you're doing some digital marketing strategy. This is a really helpful tool to see if it's something that you're actually making headway on. So check out. Has anyone heard about it here? Cool, awesome. All right, so here's, that, here's your little checklist for success. So as I said, do some market research, be humble. You need to do it anonymously. <laughs> Ask people what they think you are known for and then see if that is really what you wanna be known for. Do that personal analysis, your top five things you think you're known for and then questioning other people to see if there's any discrepancies in there. I think I'm known for this. I think this is what my brand is, but everyone else is telling me it's this. Oops. 
What do I need to do to marry those two? Or maybe there's a whole other opportunity there you didn't even know about. You never know. There might be a whole gap that you're not filling. Look at some of those tools like Clout to gather your online presence. And there are so many of them. It's a rabbit hole, so I just gave you one. That's a really simple one that's free. Build that brand statement and your promise. And if you need to keep refining it, that's okay. You should. But be really, really clear on what that brand promise is. And if you can't simply state that to someone in a short, simple conversation and convey what it is that you're delivering, go back to the drawing board again and rethink. Now time to put some of those things into action. So these are just some tactics of how you can build your credibility and build your brand. And I use those two words really synonymously, as you've heard me say, because they go hand in hand. So simple things, get out and share, share, share. So share and publish articles on your expertise. My gosh, there's so many tools now on social media. Uh, LinkedIn has a great tool right on your profile. Publish post, and suddenly you're a blogger. You've got that. Um, print is still, like, especially in smaller communities, like publish articles in your local newspaper if you can. Um, write your own blogs. You don't have to be an amazing writer, but you may want to take a couple courses on it or have someone uh, help you with it. Speak about your area of expertise at events. So if you're not a big public speaker, maybe take some public speaking course. I know there's someone I met with today who said that's what they want to do. So they're going to go take some public speaking courses. Get out there and talk about <coughs> what your, your area of expertise is. People are always looking for volunteers. We're always do, looking for them at, at uh, Business Link. That's, that's how we bring our outside experts in because we don't know everything. So we often reach out to marketing experts or lawyers or accountants and have them come speak. And the reason why they do it for free is because they're looking for, for some exposure too, right? And um, it helps them with getting more connected with their clientele. Can you go back to the previous page? Oh, sure. Do you have a question on something? No, there? no. Okay, and I'm not sure what Brenda said about slides or if people are getting copies, I'm happy to share them. So if you want a copy, maybe come see me after. I'm just not sure what Brenda has planned for that. Um, okay, so networking and events with key audiences. So first off, know who your key audience is and then get out and network at events where there's either influencers of those audiences or where that actual audience is and position yourself as the expert, right? So if you want to position yourself as, I don't know, some sort of business planning expert, then maybe you want to get in front of business owners at events to show them that you can actually help them with business plans, share some expertise, give them some best practices, because of course, if it's what you deliver is good, they're gonna come up to you afterwards or follow up with you afterwards and say, actually, you know what, you talked about a lot of really good things. Can I book a session with you? Because I think I need more help. Volunteer at any of the above. <laughs> of course, if you can get paid for it too, great. But when you're first starting your businesses, you're gonna have to do some, some volunteer work to get your name out there. And again, partner with influencers. So again, this is a huge thing of what we do at Business Link because we can't possibly serve the entire province. So we partner with other organizations like the local Chamber of Commerce, um, Futurepreneurs here, they're a close partner of ours. Alberta Women Entrepreneurs, we do a ton of work with. So we can't possibly be everywhere. We have a staff of 17. So we can't possibly be everywhere. So we partner a ton with other stakeholders in the small business community, um, which is why we're here today. And look for opportunities to align with those and position yourself as a mentor. You're that, you're that credible source that people want to come to for whatever it is they need you. Recapping here again, what do you want to be known for? Do your research. Do you already have a brand? Know what it is. People already have a perception of you, whether you think they do or not. You better know what it is. Be consistent and deliver your promise. Share your expertise. And the other really thing to remember, again, going back to sort of this corporate faceless entity, people do business with people, not businesses. So even with those big corporate brands, when you go into a McDonald's or when you go into a Walmart or whatever, when it's the people who greet you, they're representing the company and they are representing the bad brand. If you have a really bad experience with any one of those people in that big corporation or small corporation, 
that reflects on your brand. But if you have a really good relationship with them, that works well for you. It's why these big companies invest so much in training their staff. Because your frontline staff, where I think most people ignore their reception, their receptionists and stuff, oh, well, it's just the receptionist, actually is the most important person because that's your first line with your customers and that's your first impression. So remember that, the people do business with people, not businesses. All right, I think that's my time. Did I, did I overwhelm everybody or do you have any questions? Are you thinking that you can actually take a brand and apply it in your own personal life and your, your small business? Does it seem doable? Yeah? I have a question. Yeah. How is brand different from name and, name and logo? It's, it's all, um, the brand is bigger. So your name and your logo is what represents your brand, right? So a lot of people get confused that the logo, the logo and the visual identity is your brand. That is the visual representation of your brand. So your name should reflect it. Your brand is more about your value. Right? The bigger strategic picture of what your company stands for and what you stand for. Does that make sense? Does that answer your like question? A mission statement kind of, kind of. A mission statement is one element of it, right? You can get really granular to have a vision, a mission statement, and all that stuff, but that's pretty corporate. I don't know if you really need to do that. It's about the essence of what your company is and who you are as a person, right? Does that make sense? And your name and your, your logo should represent that. It's the symbol that represents it. That makes sense? Okay. Anyone else have any questions? Yeah. Just a statement similar to what you just said. I, in, just in this afternoon, in the business I've been, I've seen a dozen people in this room, at least 12 or 15 that I know, that are in the same industry I'm in. And the difference between us isn't the equipment because anybody who wants to spend a few hundred or a few thousand dollars can go out and buy this equipment and do this job. <clears throat> the difference in your business is like yourself, your business, your brand has an identity. It has a personality that you have to put out there. And that's what solidifies in my mind, or at least in all the training I've had, yeah. That's what solidifies your brand is that personality that you put into it, that it develops and has, and it's a living entity of its own. Absolutely. Yeah, I love that, that identity. And that's a lot of what marketers talk about too, is if you're trying to, um, we usually do it for customers, is develop a persona for your customer, like actually make it into almost like a mascot. Like if you were to think about what your customer looks like and you give them a name and how would you draw them, what would they look like, what's their, what do they do on Fridays? You know, how, where do they go and hang out with their kids, whatever. Think about the same thing for your brand. If it was an entity to itself, what would that character or that persona look like? What would it do? Where would it go? Um, what kinds of things would it, would it value? All that kind of stuff. Where would it go and eat dinner? You know, is it, is it a, someone who's very health conscious or someone who likes fast food? Like, those are all part of your character and, and that's the new kind of form of marketing is less about your demographics of, well, are they 25 to 40? It's more about their behaviors. And that's what online marketing is doing. That's a whole other conversation, but it's all about behaviors and interests and likes <laughs> and what you're following, right? That's why that language is used. Yes, go ahead. When do you need to be careful with how you market something that doesn't really represent who you are? Like, you know, Um, that's a tough one. I think that to say that you, you're going to be completely different than your competitors is probably not realistic. There's always going to be a certain amount of overlap. I think that the difference is um, what makes you unique. So it might not be that you have very specific separate services, but maybe it's that experience with you that's unique. So are you concerned about stepping on other people's toes? No? no. Yeah, you shouldn't be. Those are your competitors, right? No, um, okay, so just to put it out there, we have a chemical free salon spa. Yeah. Not 100%, but we do the best that we can. Yep. Yeah. We don't want to discourage other people from thinking, oh well, we have stuff that doesn't work either. Mm -hmm. But there's not a lot of people. I 
think it depends on where you think the biggest market is, right? Just because you think chemical free is uh, the thing that everyone wants, do you actually know that? Do your customers really, really care? Maybe you should ask them, right? First and foremost, is, is that something the market really, really wants? Would be my very first question to you before you put all your eggs in one basket. And yes, you should be somewhat cautious about putting your eggs all in one basket, but then the double-edged sword of that is don't try to be everything to everybody. So be, be focused, but not so narrow, especially if you're so narrow with a market that you are totally unsure of. That's like business suicide, right? A business really should be filling a gap in the marketplace. There should be a need for it. So if your clients don't really care about chemical free, my question would be to you is why are you doing it? Right? To be honest, I don't really care about what my hairdresser has, right? It's <laughs> that's just me though. But for other people, maybe that's really important. So ask your customers that. And if you might learn that, you know what, they don't really care about this and we're not attracting a whole bunch of new people because of that, why are we doing it? But maybe it's the complete opposite. So if it is what everyone knows you for, and that's what they want to do, I would think a hair salon, it's more than just the products you use. You know, like I think that's the bigger thing, is are you actually good at what you do? Oh, and by the way, we also happen to have this product line for people who care about it. It'd be kind of a secondary thing, but ask your customers, just do an anonymous survey. How important is it to you that we have chemical free products? How important it is to you that we do this or that? And all of you should do that with your customers. And even if you don't have them yet, do some like online polling. Just try not to always ask all your friends, don't do your market research with your friends and family, please. <laughs> we can do secondary market research for you because we have a whole bunch of databases that will tell you a, a bigger sample size than your friends and family. <laughs> so if you are interested in looking at you know, some of that market research side of things and don't know where to start, please give us a call. We can, we can do that for you and help you understand what that market research means.